Well, thank you for coming, everybody, for the Massive Masters Wednesday case study. Again, we always try to bring you a topic that's based on things that we think you should learn and understand that are going to help you on your investment journey. We really appreciate you spending the Wednesday evening. This is an educational series. We are not financial planners. We are not lawyers. We are not accountants. What we are trying to do is present information based on how we see it, how we believe it. As always, you need to do your own due diligence before any investing in any real estate. So we do have a bus tour coming up. We're not quite sure of the date. Uh, the last one got postponed thanks to a little thing that happened in Houston last week called a hurricane. Um, I talked to somebody today that it just got power back. That's a long time to go without power. So we will send an update on where you can go and to be able to get uh, some information on that. But it will be an in-person bus tour uh, in conjunction with PIN. Uh, later on in August. Just to kind of add a little bit to it, it uh, the concept is to build to uh, build to rent properties, where PIN is going to walk you. I mean, walk all of us through. It's how to identify a spot. How does the land development work? How does the post land development, the new construction work? And then after construction, how does the rental and the whole 360 view are built to rent? Uh, so they have been doing it for a while. We partnered with them, so we do projects at a larger scale, and they do projects at individual BTR uh, perspective. So we thought it's a very, very good case study where you can, within half a day, you get to see a concept to execution and the final product. So if you're in Houston, uh, just register for it. And then, you know, as the uh, date gets decided, we'll send you an email and we'll go from there. Awesome. Now, this couldn't even be more exciting. So as you know, we were doing our master classes. Started out with three separate days, then went to two separate days. We've learned a lot about putting on live events. And so now what we've done is we've taken all three days information, shrunk it into two days back to back, um, and it's going to be amazing. So what we're going to do is we're going to go over everything from acquisitions. How do you find a deal? How do you look at a deal? What's your buy box are you looking for? How do you underwrite a deal? Then we're gonna get into the capital. How do you raise your capital and what you do? And then we will be doing a whole presentation on how do you manage your apartments. This is in person in Houston, August 23rd and 24th. There we go. So this link here, it is going to be incredible. Um, we just decided from all the different times that we, we did our events that this was a better way to present it all of the information over two days um, we did it on a friday saturday so if you do have a w2 you can try to get a day off um, it's going to be fantastic we'll definitely have a lot of network a lot of things happening but it's something you definitely do not want to miss um, so i hope to see everybody in houston it's definitely even going to be worth flying in for you're going to get a ton of value Hundred percent. So uh, this one also, just to let you know, of our perspective, the biggest feedback that we had, it's not, you know, it's not the theory, right? We can do a lot of things in theory. It's the application part of it. It's almost, I mean, not almost everything that we talk about here. It is based on pure experience. Uh, so if you're a fund manager, you want to start a fund, or you already have a fund in the equity side, you want to bring to the real estate side. Hey, you can join. We have a couple of folks coming out from the JP Morgan. And also, if you're raising equity, we also are so in this market. So that's that's there. And if you are uh, on the JP side making acquisitions, we'll share. If you are LP side making investments, then how to qualify, how to understand, how to underwrite, how to make sure that you're placing your money right. That's the acquisition section, also the asset management asset management section, right? So we'll open every single thing. And the second part is it's a simulation. It's not us sharing what we see, it's you doing what we go through every single day. So bring your laptop, uh, it's two days. It is almost like an immersion version of the MBA program in a 15, 20 minutes of concept, 30, 40 minutes of work. Uh, that's the way we kind of model. So it's a hands-on simulation of the whole journey of how do I position myself, build a team, and then underwrite, then you know, make offers, LOI, all the way down to disposition that I'm out of the asset. So we are really excited. 
uh, then quite a bit of people are signing up. So, uh, you know, this time we increased the uh, total seat count as well. So looking forward to see you guys there. Increased capacity. So tonight we're going to talk about Massive Capital Current Activities, our value add for investors. Tonight's case study is deconstruction of the debt fund. And we'll obviously have lots of time for Q&A. And I see you added a sneaky little picture there on the right. Hey. You know, it, it's good to update the decks. So I haven't done the updating for a while. I thought, hey, we have some projects going on. So, uh, you know, it's like a subtle point. Some of the pictures that we can have is some of the projects we're working on. So, you know, that's out of the hat, right? Very good. All right. So we're a vertically integrated real estate company, developer of triple net retail town centers. We're owner operator of value add properties. You can see we're very Texas centric because all of us are mostly located in Texas, but we do have two assets in Denver, two assets in North Carolina and two assets in Atlanta, Georgia. We do equity fund brokerage on the triple net retail side, property management on the triple net retail side, development and then construction mostly on the triple net retail side. And of course we have the massive education program We'll share some more information about that. We have partnered with Realty One. Realty One is our kind of secret sauce for the retail development. They're the ones, they've been doing this for 42 years, uh, but they needed to be able to refresh. Lending has been tough, environment's been tough. So we par paired up with them so that we could bring investor capital to the deals and then work with them. We're doing a project here in Austin, Texas uh, Harris Ridge closed earlier this year. They're making great progress on the on the on the construction there. I'm super excited for that. So, all right. So our activity. So we're going to start at the bottom here. So since 2022, we've done 15 projects: a land development, value add multifamily, and then a triple net retail. Uh, we're going to go at the top, 506C. We still have some 9% remaining on our San Antonio investment. This is a great investment. You need to talk with us. We are finishing a raise uh, in West Texas, and we're under contract for retail in Katy, Texas. And we have an LOI accepted for 400 plus units in Houston, Texas. Those three new deals will start as a 506B. Talk about that a little bit later in the presentation, what the difference is on that. But I want to make sure that you understand. We got a lot of things happening. Um, it's quite interesting that, you know, we've been underwriting, underwriting, making offers, making offers, making offers, making offers, getting real close, but it's tough out there. Um, you know, we've done over 1,200 deals where we've underwritten. And, you know, you just want to make sure that you're working really hard to be able to find the best deals. This is the one <clears throat> that we have in San Antonio. And again, even this particular deal, you know, took us months to negotiate for the price, took us months to get the loan assumption done. And uh, it's a great opportunity. It's a five year hold. We're estimated to 2.11 year multiple of your money, an 18% IRR. It has a 7% prep. So for those that don't understand, that means investors get paid 7% cash on cash in their money before the general sponsorship team makes any money. It's a real investor first approach. And of course, this one does come with the tax advantages of cost segregation. So, and if you were looking for a larger investment, we'll have a 10% bonus offer. You can talk to myself, Michael, Maria, Jasmine, and Brenda, anyone else on our team. Um, it's a great project. I've been there several times. Um, it, it's just, it's a great property. Totally off topic reminder, this is month number seven, year is about to end. Uh, folks uh, who are going to earn more than 150 or more than six figures, you'll get that taxation issue. Might wanna talk to your CPA and start talking about the you know, other other uh, revenue or other income, non-W2 uh, profit that you may have, which you may need to offset. So this is a good time at preparing for those events because you know, year is gonna end. And I believe if the tax bill doesn't pass, then depreciation will be even lower next year. So this is the time, this is the year, and you know, get as much of a depreciation as you can, then it steps on to 20% even lower than this year. So if you're trying to wrap up the year and finalize your taxation of this year, this is the time to talk to a CPA and park 
um, this is one of those projects you can always bring the an investment in because of the tax uh, portion of it. Okay. And so, and one, one other thing too on taxes, the uh, 31st in two weeks, our webinar will be about tax planning and Bill, always a, a crowd favorite. Um, he's gonna come and be able to answer questions. So it's amazing. So we have a 506B deal and we don't know each other. I'm sorry, you're going to miss out because we can't let you know about the deal. And we don't want you to miss out. So if you have not established a relationship with somebody on the massive capital team, I'm going to put a link in there. You'll be able, oops, sorry, got it. That was my link for the YouTube. Book a call with us. Um, again, these calls are so we can establish a relationship. We can help you understand about investing. And then our goal is, is then we can send you these opportunities. If you're not an accredited investor, this is the only way you're going to be able to invest in commercial real estate. So book a call with us. Yeah. Massive value add group learning by doing. So our massive masterclass, we, we believe that you learn a lot more by doing. That's simple as we can put it. And so a lot of masterminds just say, here's a bunch of information. Here's a bunch of videos. Have a nice day. Hope you find a partner. Hope you find a deal. Um, and again, they've got great networks and things going for them. But we've taken the approach that we want to have our students and mastermind partners. Let's call not call them students, partners, uh, to back some work side by side with us. And the way I like to look at it is that it just it rises everything. So oh, we get 200 and 1,225 deals underwritten. We have 82 that we're currently working on. It's pretty impressive. And these are the programs that we use to do it. And these are all included in our mastermind, but monday.com, Red IQ, and Client Harbor. These are all excellent tools that are provided for tracking the deals. Um, and you can see that's a lot of deals. Um, I always sort of joke that you got to kiss a lot of frogs to find the prince. Um, we've been kissing a lot of frogs <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, uh, but that's how you find the right deals. That's how you get things done. Um, and then I've often said with our mastermind, our students are like the tide. We're on a big ship here and we're trying to do more things and take over. And as the tide comes in, it rises. And so we're able to do bigger deals, more deals. We're able to look at more deals. Um, just nothing makes anything better um for you to be able to work with a group to get these things done on that note trevor right most of the time over you know portion that we get all the things all the deals that happen how that happens and how the team works we are giving you we're sharing what happens really in day to day and every single time it's that many deals those you know, right tools right process right set of people iterations and still it's tough to make a deal happen so point is if you are investing look uh, look for a team right our always thing was and if i'm investing something and if someone says i have a billion dollar portfolio if that's the one person show you know it's a troublesome if they don't have team if they don't have process don't have a structure they're not writing enough then you know just you have to analyze it so whole point is we are sharing what is working for us what is not working for us how we are navigating through it so from you as an investor on the LP side or you as a GP side, at least you get a pulse of it and we stay close to the market as we go. And so that's why we're sharing all those things. On that note, this was from a week and a half ago. So it went up by a little bit. So, all right. So Massive is looking for partners to grow together. So we're looking for land joint ventures, acquisition. We purchase the land off market only. So don't uh, send us any on-market deals for land. We're also interested in joint venture development. So if you have land and you're looking to find a partner to develop the land, reach out to us. We're also involved, obviously, in multifamily acquisitions. We're actively looking for distressed off-market, um, 1980s plus, 150 units plus, pitched roof, no coastal areas. Um, we also can offer loan guarantee where we'll pledge our balance sheet and be able to do it. And then we also offer asset management where if you have a property that's struggling, you would like somebody to come in and take a look, somebody to come and help you. Uh, we're definitely able to do that. Um, and we do uh, 
have a way that if you want to submit a deal to Massive Capital, this is a link to a form that you can fill out and submit a deal. Now you're going to have to do your homework and you're going to have to create a best case scenario why you think this is a good deal. Again, we are not looking for on-market deals. Those are already coming to us. We're looking for a deal that you found, but you want to partner with Massive Capital to be able to make your dreams come true. We're going to put a little quiz up in here about education if you're interested. So Massive Masters, you can see underwriting live deals, okay? Access to upcoming visits, due diligence. It's pretty cool. We did a due diligence a couple of weeks ago, and I think we had like 30 people show up, and that's a great way to learn. You participate in all the LOI, all the offerings, SEC documents. We do the uh, property strategy and implementation, and we use the best in class tools, some of the tools that we talked about here before. I'm going to put a link in here uh, about more about our massive mastermind. Ooh, where did it go? And uh, we'd love to be able to talk to you about this. And again, this is a collaborative mastermind. It's very different than other programs out there. Our goal is that we're working and finding partners that we want to work with. Um, and so if you could please take the survey too, so it will help us find out a little bit more about you and your interest in this. Paul, please give us feedback. We appreciate it. Your feedback helps us adjust the courses and the topics and the case studies and everything else. So going back to the massive masters, one of the things that we struggled when we came into multifamily is it's the learning curve of it because you know oftentimes you say hey you go look at my video hey look at the pdf my book and then those are the 500 people and be my guest right and then go build a broker relationship build a lender relationship and build everything else for us what we call it when you know and within the real estate it's we add value when we buy the property right right and within the multifamily what we have seen that kind of tapered out last two three four years that's because you know, we thought we can make a phone call to broker and brokers are going to give me the best price, which is absolutely dead wrong. Uh, so our idea is about that you don't have to build a relationship. We built it. Build up on top of that. You don't have to get to know the lender. We already have done it. We interviewed the lenders. We narrowed down the price. We know how they make money. We have given them enough deals to give us the red carpet. So you go walk the carpet. And at the same thing, you know, for underwriting 1,200 deals on a spreadsheet, it's just not humanly possible. It doesn't matter how good of an underwriter you are. You need tools and a process, and you don't have to go figure that out. Uh, just think about one of our Red IQ license costs, like tons of thousands of dollars even every year. We already have it. Come and take it and do whatever that you have to do. So we shorten the learning curve and we improve the efficiency so you can walk in. It's like we build the road uh, for us. And then everybody that we walk together now, they kind of appreciate, get the benefit of walking it. And that's the benefit that we have done. We appreciate it personally when I need to get a deal. I don't want to call a broker building a relationship. I rather pick up the phone, call Mike. Mike already have done five deals with that broker and Mike can negotiate the deal for me. It's much easier, right? Sometimes it's how, sometimes it's who. And that's the whole idea about the massive masters. We don't think you don't have to call the broker right away. Just get the deal from us. Underwrite it. We already talked to the broker, call Sanjay, call Alan, call somebody else, and they will establish the road for you and we kind of go walk it. On that note, our program is a little bit different because when it comes to multifamily, we believe that everybody can do everything, but for us, which is absolutely true, and then we kind of push it in. So everybody who comes into our program, we kind of take them through a 90 days crash course, right? We want you to underwrite tens of deals, have your website if you want to raise money, then have the LOIs and we walk you through everything. And the beauty is just think about the timeline. If I'm playing solo, I'm trying to figure out underwriting. I'm trying to build a broker relationship. I'm trying to build a lender relationship. I'm trying to figure out what the market, whatever market I'm going to compete in. And then I'm trying to build a team to get the deal done. And then I'm trying to make an offer what's my likelihood of getting an LOI and what's my likelihood of getting an LOI that I am negotiating an LOI, negotiating a PSA. So for us, everything is live. We're sending out four or five LOIs a week. So be our guest if you want to draft an LOI. If you want to be on a phone call, see how to negotiate with the you know, lenders and the brokers and the attorneys, come join the call. So we kind of take you guys through and then we do a test. The self-realization happens once you push it through 
like a big chunk of work altogether, then we say, hey, choose a path, start one. Strategy 101, we cannot be everything to everybody. We gotta be something special. So we start as we have asset management and acquisition or fund manager, and we have done the writer. So that's the program that we have. So Trevor, sorry, I, I took over right. a little bit, but I you know, appreciate it. Thank you. All right, so, we're ready to get in. Put your seatbelts on, folks. So thank you. So as a context, and uh, oftentimes we talk about, you know, what well, what is a fund? It's because we hear a lot of funds, which is fund is a thing, right? Because from the SEC perspective, if you want to raise uh, equity, uh, the way you deploy or the way the way you aggregate as a fund manager, the way you earn your earnings, it's via the fund management process. And then uh, from the LP side, we also get a lot of questions about why not investing, you know, individually per projects or what's the benefit of investing in a fund, then what's the difference between a debt fund and an equity fund and all this kind of other good stuff, right? And those are right questions, right? Academically, if you think about it, everything has their places and, and rightful reasons, right? So we thought, as we walk through, uh, we had a, a session before for capital stack, and this is a, and a built up on that from the capital stack. We talk about debt and really share a little bit flavor about where does debt fund sit in within the real estate? What's the typical definition of debt fund? And what to expect uh, you know, as an investor? Uh, what kind of a risk distribution to expect? And ultimately, once you take a risk, you need to get the return. And how does the return plays out uh, compared to the risk that you take, right? So, all right, let me get started. So capital stack, uh, and I'll just to recap a little bit, uh, we have a, uh, by the way, we thank everybody subscribing our YouTube video and watching those hour long set and our videos that we're putting out. Uh, it's last 40 days or so, our subscribers went up to thousands. So thank you. And all the videos are there. And the capital stack video, it's a really good one. Uh, so on the left side, on a typical app, it's, it's capital stack means all of the money that we need to buy an asset. We have the senior debt, we have the mezzanine debt, we have the preferred equity and a common equity. That's the classic stack that we see. And depending on who chooses to use what, right? If someone says, I buy all cash, then what they're saying is that, hey, I don't want to take a no debt, no preferred, only one common equity, and it's done. When someone says, I have a deal with the pref, you know exactly where they sit. Uh, this is number one position, senior debt. This is number two. This is number three. And this is number four. And the risk perspective, since they're number one, they have the least amount of risk. If this is, 100% of the money, the senior debt just it's about 60%, 70% of the total amount. So if all goes bad, then by the time it goes to bad, the market has to hit 30%, and then it has to come through them. Hence, they are the cheapest. That's why debt is the cheapest way uh, to buy an asset, which is also why, depending on the time and the place, you want to leverage up as much as you can, because this is the least expensive. This is OK expensive. This is expensive and this is really expensive from the deal side of it. Expensive means also the return, right? From the investor perspective, you get the least amount of return because you take the least amount of risk. You take the most amount of return because you get the most amount of risk, right? So that's the, that's the definition of a you know, senior debt, which is the lowest risk in the capital stack uh, and our types of deals. And typically 99% of the time, you will have senior debt. Or... You know, if someone says I'm buying property all cash, then the return expectation of that money behave like debt. I'll use an example. Uh, you may have seen the news, Grant Cardone bought some big assets in Florida, all cash. It's a news, but behind the news is that he raised a fund that is a debt fund. So he has all senior debt all the way up and he bought the asset. It worked out now because You'll see how the debt returns are. As of now, bank rate is high. If I get a bridge debt, eight, nine percent. My thing is, if you add one more percent to it, that's a good set of fixed return for a lot of investors out there. So today is the time. It makes sense for us to invest a lot of debt fund because you get the continuity of the money at a very decent return, right? That's that's how we did it. Uh, mezzanine debt, it's a, it's a little bit higher. Typically, mass debt happens when uh, you want to leverage but uh, the senior debt is not quite there. Uh, then you're saying, hey, I have additional property somewhere and I guarantee it, you give me that because the mezzanine debt, you know, it has some personal guarantee to it. It's just not for everybody. Uh, it's typically, we don't see it in the multifamily. We see a lot of that in, um, in the new construction side. 
because new construction side they give a lot of money on the capex uh, but there is no there is no tenant yet so they may require you to do some mess that to it uh, i'll give you an example as you go so we are working on one of the projects now uh, it's going to be a 17 million dollar loan and that loan will be somewhere between a mess debt and a senior debt. And we have to put our you know, balance sheet online for that one. And so you'll see the mess debt being taken by senior operators, senior developers who've been in the game for a while and made a decent amount of money, strong balance sheet, uh, not the uh, incoming first timers. Uh, pref equity uh, sits on top of the mess debt and the pref. Uh, they are like a junior partner. Um, uh, they are suitable for larger assets, typically 20 plus million. Now we're seeing about 25, 30 million or more mess that, uh, and also our pref checks make sense because typical entry point for them is $5 million. And they wanna be you know, at best 80% of the deal after their money. So deal has to be big enough. Uh, so, and you know, when you avoid uh, pref debt, when market is hot. When market is hot, you don't leverage up that much, but when, when market is at its worst all day long, all the way up. So. As you go, and the common equity is the highest risk, and typically it's the retail equity, it's the fund that we raise, you know, and as you go, right? Hundred percent the multifamily, hundred percent the you know um, the retail construction that we do, we bring in common equity. Then we go. So it's a lot. I understand it's a lot. It's a lot to visualize. It's a lot to understand, which is okay. So I, what I tried is I tried to visualize it uh, instead of. All those words, I said, if you want to visualize, what does it look like? So this is what a version of it. Uh, the x-axis is the risk, y-axis is the return. So point B is the lowest. I mean, this uh, the small one on the far left is the smallest. So imagine this is your senior debt and all the done your common debt. So again, this is purely from academic. There's a number associated with it. It's a directional view. So you can see left to right, right? Now, the point, you know, you need to think about the, the idea or the thought that we should have here who I am, what type of investors I am, how long I want to be in the investment game, or what's my runway left or remaining, what I choose to be, and then how do I build my portfolio? So as an investor, you want to be, uh, you want to continuously build a portfolio over time and a distributed portfolio. You shouldn't invest only in Houston, only in multifamily, only in one type of class B assets. Then if the market turns, it's a world of pain versus you distribute the assets, distribute the asset class, locations, types, then it's a healthy mix. If part of it doesn't work, dominant chunk is working. So your net result is still there, right? So, so think about that perspective. You distribute your risk and it, here the debt sits in, right? And then there is a curve. What we say is that within that domain, there's a different type of returns. So our job is to get stay on top of the line, which is we take the same risk like, like other, but we'll try to get a better return. So for the same risk, we get a better return. So we try to look at that, that, hey, keeping all things equal, if I deploy the capital on a project A versus project B, where do I create more value? Where do I have a bigger margin? And then we decide how to kind of play and kind of go from there, right? So that's there. And how do I break it down? So then the question becomes on the finance perspective, hey, I understand I want to do fund, right? The concept today is the fund, especially on the debt fund, which is I want to be in the city or debt side of it. I want to take the lowest amount of risk because on a fund side, typically you are the first lean position, right? So uh, on that note, uh, anybody have questions, please drop a note uh, on the chat box. We'll come back and cover. Absolutely no problem. Uh, or if you want to come on, you know, just unmute yourself and ask the question as we go. So the first thing is the risk visualization. So you have one. Uh, homework for you. When you get a chance, uh, put all of your LP investments or GP investments on a um, Excel file and then list it out. And then you'll see what your portfolio looks like on the real estate side. All right. So let's see from here. Uh, we're gonna do one, uh, so we understand the risk. Now we're gonna do one investment, just one, right? If I do one investment, what happens? I have a big band of investments, right? So here, if you, and I, I kind of took a chart from another gentleman, he does good on risks. Uh, X-axis is the expected risk, low, medium, and high. I'm using this stock just to kind of give you that. So low risk has a low return. 
But then the question becomes, if my risk from left to right, as you go to the right, you can see, even though I'm taking risks, I'm not getting returns. So if you aggregate all of a return, you wanna avoid this peak right here. You wanna be in this zone, where you're taking the risk and your potential upside is higher. That means even though I am getting low return, if the market happens or if something happens, I get a bigger upside, right? So that's the idea from the investment perspective. You always wanna be on the side of the market. You don't wanna be too far away from the market. And then when the market turns with you, you kind of turn that, which is also why we love doing projects that has a higher interest rate because I'm close to the market. If the market gets better, I get better with the market. If the market stays constant, it's fine, right? We already paying high. And you know, going higher, extremely unlikely, but if it does, I'm not gonna get hurt too much right? because I'm at the market. On the other side, if we do low interest rate, but we're not too low, but close to, close up to the market, we do a loan assumption. So three years down the way, you can pick up the same loan without bringing in too much money. So I have potential exit and we play in between. Uh, you may have heard us saying that we don't underwrite anything less than 4%, uh, anything like that. We try to stay around a 4.5% interest rate. Gives us a lot of comfort zone because market is about 5.5, 5.6. I'm at a 4.5, close to the 5. It's a good spot to do it because if I buy something at a 3% interest rate, I am cash flowing today, which is true. But that's because I have a low interest rate. The moment that goes away, which is when you're gonna, then your NOI will be punished because somebody has to pay a high interest rate. So automatically you have to work for free and NOI to cover for the higher expense. And then you have to work double to get you know, uh, get profit, which is why we kind of shied away. Our, most of us, we shied away from the very low interest rate assumption that doesn't have a very long uh, hold time, right? Now the question becomes, hey, I do, back to this, we have done one investment. Now, if I, if we're investors, then we got to continuously invest all the time and we have to shorten our peak. So what we do is this, we keep on investing. So we, you know, off, I mean, coming into 2024, uh, folks who invested, including us, 2022, 2023, and 2024, depending on the asset that you invest with, some of them may not have worked out. Some of them you may have to go right off but it hurts, it is, but at the same time, it, it does not mean that you stop investing because you gotta average it out, right? How many times we own a stock, price went down, and we believe whatever we believe, we double down. Real estate investment is a very similar version of it. So if you look at the aggregate portfolio, if one or two assets are not working, you continuously invest. So the longer you invest and the more you invest, over time you average out. And that's the beauty of and investing over the long horizon and distribution and a distributive type approach that you will average out. Don't just do one and stop because you may have a different experience. So that's the point of this slide that distribute your risk. So for us, we took that approach. So where we want uh, have our investors to have a portfolio of options. And if someone you know, wants to do a but we call it, we look at the return in three different ways. Uh, one is the tax adjusted return, mostly on the multifamily side. One is the higher velocity of return, which is the um, you know, new construction side. The other one is the highest total return. That sometimes falls in between. So we try to strike a chord between those. That triangle, we try to hit two. But core is one, then we work towards the other one. So from your perspective, if you do multifamily, as you know, it's typically five years. If you do new construction, it's typically three years. If you do triple net cash flow, it's longer horizon, no upside, no downside. It's a continuous flow. Now, if you have a blend of it, you get some cash flow, you got a retire exit coming up in three years, have the exit coming up in five years. So you're mixing, match it up. So every year something is happening, right? And you also distribution there because different asset classes, different asset category will perform a different way depending on the economic timeline but your portfolio is still performing, right? So that's there. All right, so, and then, you know, the question is how do I decide, you know, whether we invest in funds or we invest in not funds, right? So our thing is, you know, invest, you know, as, a, as an investor, we need to have a longer period of time horizon. 
right? Uh, and if we come in and try to flip right away all this other stuff, uh, that has some distribution problem, risk adjusted problem. And the secondary problem is, hey, you know, one investor can say, hey, I got 25% and I'm happy with it. And you could debate, hey, I got 12%. I'm happy with it. Uh, why I'm happier than you are? Because, you know, think about it, somebody who may, who may make 25%, Maybe it's a three year, I mean, let's see, three months flip. Rest of the nine months is sitting out there. On average, 12 months adjusted, less than, it's like a high, high single digit. Versus if someone has continuous 12% or 10%, money is working. You've done your work one time and it's going, right? That's one of the beauty of the debt fund. Most of the folks on the debt fund, they will invest because you have done your work once, you know you took the least amount of risk and you have a continuous money flow at all time till the debt matures. And typically they mature in three, four or five years out. So you'll see the debt fund stay uh, a little bit longer, right? Uh, here we go. Uh, in the short term, it's always problematic. So flip mindset, it's problem as an investor. So you wanna stay in as long as you can. And then you wanna distribute as much as you can. At least academically, that's what we believe, right? So takeaway is invest, continuously invest. Adjust your dollar amount that you invest if you don't feel comfortable, depending on the time, but keep on investing, and especially in this market. Uh, so we can hear all the news. The news are true. It has a meaning to it, but that's a lagging news because if someone goes, if I hear there's a foreclosure or something happened, it happened a year and a half ago. I'm hearing it today, but market bottomed out six months ago. And that's why you'll see now it's a good time. It's very less noise in the market, very less competition, rightfully so. Investors are being very picky. That means the deals that, that are happening today, those are healthy deal. You have a better footing into those deals moving forward because we know at least we have a very good clarity what segment, of, what cycle of the business we're in. And then everything gets better from here. This is the worst what we have seen as of now. All right, so now... Bring it back to the debt fund. Uh, how do they fit into real estate? On the left side, they're typically three different kind of funds, debt, hybrid, equity. Risk goes from, on the right side, the lowest amount of risk, mixed risk, and the equity risk. So think about the capital stack, right? I kind of changed that up a little bit more, and, and that's what it is. So here we're talking about the debt fund. Uh, so if, if as an investor, if someone said, I have a fund, come invest with me. Second question you ask, what type of fund? That means you are taking a risk. Right? If someone says, I'm, I have an equity fund, but I'm paying 8%, you'll be like, okay, uh, that's same as the debt fund. Why am I going to take the same I'm mean, more risk, get paid the same amount? That means risk adjusted, I'm getting paid less, right? My, my return is less, right? So those are the type, the questions you got to ask. Uh, so on the debt side, they're typically, uh, they have a first lien position against the hard asset or some kind of guarantee. Something happened, I can take over something and I can sell something, I will get away with something. Um, it's And the, one of the beautiful thing about the funds, debt funds are that whoever is borrowing from the debt fund, they're bringing in equity as well. So if market goes down, something has to go down to that. And the most common debt fund in real estate are breach debt, construction debt, short-term asset-based loan and rehab loan. So think about all the lenders who are giving you a breach debt, which is three, uh, eight and a half percent, nine percent, twelve percent that's what they're doing. Uh, if you go a, you know, let's say uh, Arbor or CBRE or JLL, they give you a broker deal on a bridge debt, eight and a half percent, nine percent. What they're doing, they're going to the market, getting a loan for five and a half, six percent, adding a markup, uh, selling that to you. And if you go to a debt fund to get a loan, then they're raising the money at a seven or eight percent because what happens, all the, all the large pension funds, and they are solving for seven, eight percent today. So they're borrowing from them at a seven, eight percent and they're selling it for 12%, 11%. They're taking a the spread of 2%. And that's how you know, the fund and the specter return happens. And then if you know all those, as you look at the deal, you can size your deal right so you know. On the flip side, if you're an investor into a debt fund, you know what type of legalities, what type of questions to ask, and how do you kind of go, right? So we talked about fund definitions a little bit. We talked about the risk distribution. We brought it down to the funds. Then the question is, what is my return, right? Because we understand fund has the least amount of risk. Fund is a stable income, a little, a little bit of longer horizon. Now the question is, what's my return, right? Okay. 
example, I, I, you know, I copied from there. It's a mutual fund. They have a lot of debt funds. You can Google it. You can uh, look at your Fidelity or whatever platform that you use. They have mutual funds. Those are example. As you can see, left to right, longer you stay, you tend to get a premium for it. So you got to stay in. Market understands it. And then the investor gets a return for it. It's mostly because fund in and out has a cost associated with it. And it's a continuous flow. So if you break the flow, there's a cost and they're taking the cost. And if you stay in, they give you a premium back. So stay in. So you can see at the institutional level on the liquid fund, that means liquid means, you know, you will bring in the money today, you can get out tomorrow. And at the bond is you come in, you got to stay in, right? So that's that's where it goes. So as of now, the highest you can do, if you commit for 10 years, you get 8%. So that's at the mutual fund level. Beautiful thing is you take even less of a risk because if you do one fund in one project has a risk, but if you do one fund that goes to 10 projects, you have even distributed the risk, right? And that's there. So that's the beauty of doing a fund. You get a little less of return, but your risk is very distributed across multiple assets. So what happens if you do if your fund goes to 10 projects, one project goes bust, no big deal. Nine will carry the other 10 and works out. Now, from that nine, one could be stellar, right? And now, and you can, that could also cover the 10. Then on the flip side, if I'm an LP investor, happen to be I invested that LP, that stellar asset, I would like, I'll never do fund. But if the savvy investor would have spent the money into the one that went bust, experience will be different, right? So always think about your experience, adjust it for the risk that you took, and then you make your choice as you go. Now that's on the fund level, at the debt fund, mutual fund, and the larger fund level. Let's look at a real estate level. This is DLP funding returns, and I'm advertising for them now. Um, they've been there for a while, and they are one of those you know, fund of funds, so they will aggregate investor money, and then they will do it, right? As you can see, 2018 to 2023, uh, it's a continuous return, right? You are lending it, and you're paying back. You are lending it, you're paying back. You are ultimately the bank but they get you a continuous return. So typically on um, the real estate debt fund, you get about eight to 10%, depending on how big the fund is and how many projects that they go in. So all the, uh, long way coming back here saying, hey, if you wanna stay in a fund, you should expect high single digit to slightly above and you know, a double digits, continuous. Like every quarter check comes in as you go. You don't have upside. At the same time, you don't have a downside, but you have a systematic cash flow as you kind of go through on this project. So. All the way saying, hey, take your, uh, you know, take your pick, build a portfolio that's, that, that stays in the corner. That means you got to invest in the multiple projects, have a long horizon, do some debt, do some funds, do some debt funds, do some equity funds, do some, you know, uh, direct investment as well. So if you want the most return, direct investment. If you want the second best return, it's a fund. If you want the very low risk return, that's your debt. If you want low, low risk return, that's your fund, debt fund that you have. All of the things that we're saying, it's also because we have a debt fund. So Master Capital has a, uh, we started a, a debt fund. Um, we, we took some funds already. And then personally, I had a debt fund that we deployed for the equity on the land side since 2018. And now we have grown that up. Uh, we learned a lot of stuff to bring it to the massive debt fund. We haven't quite publicized yet, uh, I think. Uh, and this is leading that debt fund. Uh, it's it's a very similar pattern. And we're just finalizing the return on the legal you know legalities of it, and we'll bring it to uh, to our investor base sometime within a week or so. Okay. That was a lot. Open for Q and A. All right, let me see what we have here. I'll stop sharing, then we'll just cover that. Trevor, you on mute? No, launch launch one last poll for today. Okay. Just on investment types and things that people might, we talked about a few different investments and what types of investments would people love to have, like to have, and um, so that it helps us target, you know, what we're doing as well. You know, what are we, what are the deals we're looking for and uh, more types of different funds and how we can, you know, be sure to cater to the investors that are out there. Cool. Thank so, you, Mike. It, I really appreciate uh, you guys take a chance to update the put, uh, give us some feedback on the poll here and uh, 
see where we can get on that. Appreciate it all. And go ahead with Q&A. Yeah, so if anybody has any questions, you can feel free to unmute yourself and ask the question. Um, and again, if you found some value, we appreciate that. We would ask you to come back next week with a friend. Um, our goal here is to provide an environment where we kind of try to tell it as it is. We answer questions. If we don't know the answer, we go out and try to find the answer. Um, you know, it's so this is an environment where we make it fun and easy for everybody to learn. As I did mention, all of these are recorded. So go ahead, Andy. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, guys. I'm glad that I joined today, finally, as I've been trying to make this uh, webinar for the longest time, ever since uh, Fun Launch. <laughs> um, I, I feel like I just jumped into the the best the best webinar today. It was just amazing on Capital Stack and um, great presentation, 10 out of 10. Um, so really interesting. So, you know, just I guess in a sense, the whole keep investing. So it's in a sense, your dollar cost averaging, your investment, hedging your risk in a sense, because no one's going to bat 100, right? That's I've lost money on real estate investment. So it makes sense. But I guess, how would how would you frame that? Like, if would, would you, how would you frame that to your LPs in theory? And like, how does that affect your credibility for the next fund or the next deal that you might work on? Got it. So um, let me kind of recap the question, right? You're asking, how do I position myself as a fund manager? Correct. Yeah. Right. Okay, cool. That's awesome. So what happens is, uh, and what we call it strategy 101, right? You got to be something special to somebody. You cannot be everything to everybody. So as a fund manager, we have to pick our investment hypothesis. So and at the very beginning, you'll say, hey, let me use an example. Uh, you say, I am a fund manager of a fund that does debt only, mm. right? If that's the case, you are talking to a version of the folks who really want a low risk adjusted, I mean, risk adjusted return, but a continuous return. That type of folks will be from IRA or, you know, they're building a cash flow because they want to retire or they're building a, you know, exit from a W-2 or something in that fashion. So that's your pool of conversation. So your pitch is, I am a strong manager. I know how to evaluate the projects right. And my money goes to a strong projects where it is protected. I'm a very good LTV, loan to value, and I'm giving you a very good return. So this is one of, one of the places you come in, you bring the money every quarter, you get a check. You don't have to call me. I'll just get you the check. You don't have to figure out what the performance of the asset look like. That's all. So that's your thing. So if you, you have to say one. And once the one grows up to something else, then you'll see, hey, if we have 50, 20, 30, and 100 investors, 10 of the investors say, hey, Andy, I love your you know, investment hypothesis. I love that. But some chunk of money, it needs a higher return. Can you find me a project? Then you get to say, hey, I started a second fund, which is, which is my equity. Mm. Has a higher risk, higher return. So that's how you do your credibility. That's how we do it. So that's one way, right? Other ways, let's say, I don't have it. Right. Let's, I, let's, you know, I know you, Andy, hypothetically, and you have quite a bit of funds already, and you have been successful based on the return that you have provided. Right. I just started today, you know, for whatever reason. Right. I started today and I don't have a resume. So then what we have to do, I have to find Andy one, two, three. Right. I have to see who has a stronger team, who underwrites, who's doing the deals. Then I say, hey, Andy, can I be a part of your fund? So then what happens is I transfer the the risk that I cannot manage into Andy. And because Andy also mitigate the risk, together it's one resume. So you have to couple with someone and then bring the money into a joint venture fund, then you deploy the fund. We mm -hmm. do that quite a bit as well. Let's say, you know, you have a debt fund hypothetically, and the debt fund, you know, or you have a project. Yeah. You have a debt fund. Mike is raising to the debt fund, but Mike, Mike just started. So I would say, Mike, come on in. Let's let's do a joint venture fund. That joint venture fund goes to end this project. I and I, might, I have a process of underwriting. I have a process of approval. I have the legal stuff in check. Let's go joint venture. So you'll be end up joint venture to build your resume. Okay, got it. Awesome. Can I ask one more question? Yeah, please. Um, so with, with the capital stack diagram with the senior debt and the the preferred 
equity and the the common equity it could could one say that the preferred equity would be the LP and the yeah, common yeah. would be the GP uh common or GP. Or, or, yeah. or yeah okay yeah typically that's the case right uh, okay. typically you would expect GP to be at the very end that they're like on top of common right whole idea is like a, what a one of our deal we talked about there's a seven pref there's a 17 hurdle right uh, and as a general partner we are creating values Mm -hmm. You know, and we are supposed to get our earning once the values are created. We're not supposed to get paid up front, right? So whole idea is it's a waterfall. Debt gets paid, capital gets paid, capital returns start getting paid, then the general partner. So you'd expect general partner to be on top end of the LP side, not at okay. the bottom of the top end. That's all. Okay. Now, on that note, some general partner may have fund, their own personal money, right? Or their business is big enough, they have a fund. They're also the general partner, but then it could be under the same umbrella, but who cares? You just look at them individually and they kind of go, right? That's all. Okay. Awesome. Now, good question. Thank you, Andy. And I appreciate you joining. What was the question? Right, Andy? Sorry, I'm getting a call at the same time. Oh, so... no, no, no worries. <laughs> I said it was well worth the wait for you coming oh. on. Oh. 100% I got a lot of takeaways. I was just teaching someone about capital stack, but you know, you guys just, I took, I was like, wow, this, this is a lot better. <laughs> well, this is a lot better. I'm, I'm going to be honest. This is a lot better. It was really good. It's really good. Excellent. Thanks for joining. Yours, man. Thank you for joining. You know, and one thing too, I want to talk about somebody, let's talk more from the passive investor side, right? Of spreading and diversifying your yeah. risk. I've said this several times where it's like playing a baseball game. If you go for a home run every time, you're never going to get to the World Series. So you're going to want to hit a couple of singles, a couple of doubles, and then take a couple of shots to say, okay, I think this is the time to take my moment. And then you balance those out. And that's how things, all the different timelines, the different asset classes, the different things, that balance is what gives you kind of, I'm going to call it a winning game. And my, my thought on that one is, look, if you know how to hit single every time, you'll know how to hit the hammer and hold run when the ball shows up, right? Keep a scoring it, the right scoring. Don't miss it. We think it's expensive. But if you just hit the ones, just continuously hitting it, the when the home run ball shows up, you know how to hit that, right? Yeah. But flip side is tough. Flip side is extremely tough. Yes, Ajay, go ahead. AJ, go ahead. Yeah, come on. Come online. Just, yeah, you should thanks, be able to unmute yourself. And, uh, sorry, I was having a tough time getting off mute here. Thanks, Sharyar, first of all. Good presentation. Real quick, just in terms of uh, making this real to the investors, so I get the debt aspect of it, which is explain the structure. Now, from the GP aspect of it, I just want to make sure I understand that correctly, Sharyar. If we have a deal and we bring the deal over to you. Of course, it's something which may be an off-market and we think there's value, we've done the base underwriting. Will you be as, uh, in, uh, this debt fund becomes a co-GP on that deal. Is, is that the model you're really propagating here, which then goes through the life cycle? Yes, so what we take a look, let's see, let's, okay. So thank you, I can answer. I, sorry, I jumped in the middle of it. So question is asking, you know, let me kind of recap. You have a deal, you come to us and we say, hey, can you bring in some equity? And right. the question is, are we going to bring in the debt fund as a part of the deal making, right? So so on that note, my answer will be, uh, it depends, right? So our goal is we are what we call a wounded alpha returns, which is, and I want to take the least amount of risk, uh, risk to get a little bit more extra arbitrage, right? So on a deal, as of now, we have more deals than the capital. So all of our deals that we are getting, uh, the equity is deploying to our projects. On the debt is for certain you know, certain type of deals. So let's say we are gearing to our you know, and debt fund and going towards the land acquisition mm -hmm. because it puts us in a very low risk, number one. That's because land, it's a, when someone buys a land, leverage is not a whole lot. Bank will give you 50%, we can give you 60, 70%. Still, you gotta bring 30%. So you have a lot of, lots of skin on the game. And the second thing is that uh, we grew up, I mean, at least I started my real estate on the land side. As a team, 
with the R1 and us, we transacted over two, 300 pieces of land in the last five years or so. So we understand the land play. So we can underwrite the land and are very strong compared to some of the other folks. And the last thing is there is no draw, mm -hmm. like a construction debt, right? Construction, I have to check how much you're doing and where you at and whether it's right, then check the invoices, to do a lot of reconciliation, then do it. So we took a very you know, relaxed, pragmatic approach. And so our debt fund is gearing towards that, plus a portion of very unique situations where we have seen you in action. We know you know the very short term funding to get something done and pricing makes sense that we'll come back and plug that in. And we, again, it's a small, we're looking for a better return. So that's how we are gearing our debt fund. So on the on the flip side, let's say you have a deal on the GP side. So we'll underwrite it as if we are doing the deal independently, mm -hmm. and then we'll compare with you underwriting, and then we'll debate about the Delta. And if you can come to an hand, then we'll say, hey, we can guarantee the loan, we can take an asset management, or we can raise the equity as you go. Okay, Did thanks, thanks for the clarification, Sherry. So the debt piece fairly focused on the land aspects. That's right. And then if we have a multifamily deal, which we think we have underwritten well, to your point, you would validate that and then potentially join our hands on that. And then of course, as a KP, as a co-GP plus asset management, those are the three options you bring to the table. And then That's correct. Back to red. Got it. That's Got correct. It. And uh, just to kind of build up, uh, we have a different approach. Uh, so we believe anybody who has a $30 million or over, you must have full-time employees and a process. And uh, just like any other you know, mid-sized companies, if something happens to the C-level team, you have a backup takeover option, right? The same thing. Uh, we said we, we can establish that. So on the finance side, uh, we have a finance team. We're heavily recruiting an asset manager. We have four finance team. We have a process. They run the asset management uh, on the side on parallel and we don't believe we do not believe that uh, we should go into a property management company where property management will tell me what's going on which is two weeks old and i'm making a forward-looking decision so what we do we have our own software that sits on top of the property management software and we run data every monday so when you walk into the property management company we took a look at it our finance team will prep me mike or sanjay about what's going on with the asset we benchmark all the assets a certain way. So when we walk in to the meeting, we have a good idea about what's going on with the property. Then we ask the property management, hey, why didn't you do this? Why did you do this? 40 days from now, I'm expecting this issue. What's your plan for it? So it's a different kind of asset management. A uh, little bit what we see, a little bit more institutional type framework into the retail space. And that's the value that we add when we bring into the, when we talk about asset management, which is not conventional typically that you see. Excellent. No, thanks. That That's actually very helpful. That's more operational, uh, 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 in, not just improvement, but to your point, controls, correct? So that, that's that's... controls in real time, right? I mean, yeah. for everyone, if you run a property and a multifamily, so think about this way. Your income of current month, you cannot do anything after day number five, right? So we have 10 days to optimize whatever that we do for future next month earning. So it's very crucial to stay online real time, what's going on with the data. And also at the same time, your data structure must tell you what's, what is happening you know, now, and that's going to extrapolate to another event 40 days out, 60 days out, so you can take your team through it. And without a proper, and, and I'll, I mean, your software or platform, you can't. It's not the spreadsheet basis where you just run the number, look at backward looking, because 100% of the tools that we have, it's backward looking data. What happened? I got a result. But as a managers, as a managers, we are looking forward and say, hey, it happened, already happened. Whatever's supposed to happen 40 days out, how can I prepare for that one? So we use that software for those type of conversation mostly. Great. A good question. Thank you for asking. Yeah, I appreciate it. That's a great question. Uh, Phil, Anybody yes. Else? Uh, Phil sent me a note. Uh, yes, all the recordings are on YouTube. Uh, it's there. It gets posted within two or three days. Uh, it's uh, youtube.com at Massive Capital, I believe. Yeah, I posted the link in there, yeah. Okay, someone asked me a question about the asset management software. Uh, we'll do a session. We'll walk you guys through. Uh, so that's, uh, it is, uh, we built it on, on the Power BI, so we have a data. Uh, so what we do, we download all the reports. So what we have seen is that uh, if you go to any asset management software, they have lots of reports. And they're gonna tell you, yeah, I have 
lots of reports for everything you want. But ideally, if you want to drive a decision, every performance got to give us an independent variable to drive a decision, right, or drive an action. And what we have seen is that not all the reports will give you the holistic view. You need to have a piece of 10% of a report one, 20% of a report two, 30% of a report four, then some data is missing, but you got to run like 10 reports to build the storyline together. So what we do, we that's what we do. Every asset from our you know, PM software, we download 10 to 15 reports. Then we have a master mapping. And we, we force all the reports into one format, and then we cut the data. So that part, so we have you know, one of our finance team member, he just runs that, those reports, hundreds of reports every Monday. And, and the dashboard, it's pretty meaningful because all of the investment that we have done, they're forced into the same, uh, the KPIs that we do. All of a sudden we have a force ranking and then all the things that we learned over time, we bake it in as a KPI. So I don't have to run a report as asset manager. My analyst is running the report for me. And then all the dashboard that I have that indicates some kind of a, you know, reaction or action. So we can drive those conversations as we go. Good question. You don't want to look backwards. You want to look forwards, or at least today. Awesome. 